Larry, there is an article in Financial Times in which one senior G7 diplomat says that we've definitely lost the battle in the global south. All the work yeah. we've done with the global south over Ukraine has been lost. Forget about rules, forget about world order. They won't even listen to us again. With this conflict in Ukraine and this new conflict in Israel, it seems that it's not just about the global south. It seems to me that it's a collective West against the global rest. How do you, know, you find it? Well, as, as I've, I've been saying for you know, several months now, what this uh, special military operation by Russia has created or uh, uncovered is the unraveling of the international political and financial order that was created in the aftermath of World War II, which meant that the United States, with the cooperation of the United Kingdom, France, uh, would dominate the world. And that uh, countries like China and Russia were sort of seen as, you know, uh, kids sitting in the back seat. They weren't really in charge. They weren't equals that had to be dealt with. And uh, this this entire one of the un unexpected consequences of the special military operation by Russia is that it's, it's, it's completely unraveling the old world order where you know, the United States dominated the Middle East. When, when you know, Israel would get into a, a fracas with one of its neighbors or with a Hamas or with Hezbollah, the United States would be working behind the scenes with Jordan and or Egypt and or Saudi Arabia to try to smooth things over, or try to get the killing stopped and, you know, get the fighters back in their respective corners. That's not happening now. Uh, those countries are ignoring the United States, uh, telling the United States to basically get lost. So uh, I think the, the whoever the source was for the Financial Times article was uh, correct. With this conflict in Israel, it seems that it overshadowed the battle in, in Ukraine. What do we know right now? What's going on in Ukraine right now? Well, the the, the counteroffensive, Ukrainian counteroffensive, has uh, been a disaster for Ukraine, and uh, Ukraine has made no significant progress anywhere along the line of contact uh, from north to south. And Russia has begun pushing back and taking territory previously occupied by Ukraine. And in the process, still killing a, an enormous number of Ukrainian soldiers. So as the weather continues to turn colder, as the leaf, the foliage drops to the ground and the leaves pile up, it's going to be more and more difficult for them to camouflage their activity. And they're going to have to try to, the Ukrainians will have to try to find dig in better, dig in underground, uh, Russia's war of attrition will continue. And th there's nothing the West can do to stop it. And particularly uh, the, what I guess the real meaning of the war in Israel is, it's divided U.S. resources. U.S. could not even support and sustain Ukraine. And now it's got to provide military assistance to Israel. Uh, despite what uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin says, the United States cannot walk and chew gum at the same time. Hell, they don't even have a pack of gum to chew. Janet Yellen just recently said that the U.S. economy is doing great and we can support both wars in Ukraine and in Israel. Joe Biden said that this is a smart investment in Ukraine that we're mm. doing. Is that based on reality? Uh, no, I mean, it's completely divorced from reality. The concept of an investment is that you take money or something of value to you and you purchase something that you believe is going to increase in value. Well, Ukraine is not going to increase in value. Uh, it's lost almost 40% of its population from what it was at the start of the Russian special military operation. It's lost the significant chunks of its territory that were homes to industri major industrial enterprises, mines, and other natu natural resources, including some rare earth minerals. So by, and then the manpower that is lost in terms of killed and wounded in the war. 
is just it's astronomical in terms of the per capita basis. So on, on, on how how do you find that that's increased in value? It's made Russia stronger, not weaker, despite what Biden says. But you know, it's just it's a symptom of the of the, of the decay and decline in the United States that you have a demented old man like Biden who's so completely out of touch uh, with reality that he he thinks, well, yeah, we're doing great, we're winning, when clearly we're not. This flow of weapons and funds to Ukraine are going to increase as Biden is advocating for, or it's going to decrease over time? Well, I don't see how, uh, you know, Congress is going to have to approve it. And what Biden proposed is giving roughly 60% of the money to uh, Ukraine and 14% of the money to Israel. That, you know, that's not going to, that's not going to fly. Is uh, you know, saying in the South and the United States is that dog won't hunt. Uh, I think Congress is going to turn around and already flip those numbers, insist that Israel get more than Ukraine, and be very skeptical of providing any more significant aid to Ukraine, particularly since they, they failed on the battlefield. One of the important things that we've seen in this battle in Israel was the role of Russia. Right now, right. we have the total disconnection between Russia and the West. It's creating more problems for Israel. Oh, yeah. No, it absolutely has. Um, this we, We've seen the evolution of this in the UN Security Council, where on the first vote that uh, the resolution to condemn what's going on in the war between Palestine and, and Hamas, that... Uh, the United States was able to rack up a majority of the countries on the council to vote to vote against that. But uh, the, on this last vote, it was only the United States that vetoed Brazil's uh, resolution. So that shows you sort of the direction things are headed. That, uh, you know, when Biden went to ostensibly meet not only with Netanyahu, but then to go talk to the king of Jordan and the president of Egypt, and the president of the Palestinian Authority of us, they can't. They blew it off. They canceled it because of the Israeli attack on that hospital uh, in 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 the Gaza Strip. Al, I guess it's Al Ali. And uh, then Anthony Blinken went to visit uh, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, and what happened there? Bin Salman stood him up all night. You know, I said, oh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be with you in a bit. and made him wait all night and then saw him in the morning. It was less, you know, it was a short meeting and nothing significant came out of it. They were trying to, the United States was seeking to get Egypt and Saudi Arabia to, you know, to do some intervention with Hamas potentially so that they could, uh, you know, get, get, get the things quieted down, cool the temperatures. Th that failed. So, the United States' influence in the region has really disappeared. Uh, the United States is not feared nor respected. The attack on the hospital. Israelis are blaming Palestinians for doing that. And Palestinians are talking about that. It was Israelis that hit this hospital. What's your evaluation? What's your assessment on, on this incident? You know, I've been, I've been trying to hold off making a judgment on it, you know, trying to weigh all the different facts. But... Uh, I've I've come to the conclusion that I think it was an Israeli, uh, probably an Israeli drone, uh, that uh, uh, Hellfire mission uh, Hellfire mission missile type. But why do I say that? Uh, number one, I've searched the web, and I'll challenge any of your listeners and viewers to do the same. Find me one example, just one of Hamas launching a rocket and missile at Israel that matches that kind of explosion. You don't have it. Uh, number two, the, the rockets, missiles fired by Hamas are not these precision-guided, uh, GPS-guided uh, devices. They're, they're sort of uh, shoot and spray. You know, they fire them off, and it's, uh, you know, like that old... I shot an arrow in the air and where it landed, I know not where. Well, that's, you know, they shoot it off and it's going to land somewhere in Israel, but they don't, they're not able to precisely target. Uh, it would appear that if 
if this was just an errant missile off course, you know, that, that you, it'd be just an unspeakable tragedy, but it was an accident. But the thing that makes you say it's probably not an accident is within 23 minutes of that m missile or that device blowing up in the courtyard outside the hospital, uh, the, the Israeli spokesman for Bibi Netanyahu was out taking credit for it. Now, I'm not even sure the news had reported in any of the details, but he was citing it as this is the reason they hit that. This is uh, being being used by Hamas you know, to, to store weapons and for military operations. So it, it really boils down to the fact that the, the size of the device that went off was uh, nothing that is been that we have seen in the possession of Hamas. Is it possible they got something new? Maybe, but then the there's the Israelis haven't even been able to agree on where the origin of fire was. I know that U.S. intelligence claims that it has spotted the or they they spotted a, a rocket launch by Hamas, and they were going on the assumption that it was a, you know an errant rocket. But again, I come back those. So from what I've been able to pick up and look at on the web, I've not seen a single instance of a device that ignites like that. And the it, it ignites in midair because there was some compression down and it did leave a small crater. But uh, the damage that came out of that was not just by a, a rocket that uh, Hamas made. So that's uh, unfortunately, Israel's been hitting other civilian targets. They they hit the a Greek Orthodox Church yesterday, or within the church complex and and a building and killed sixteen people. So Israel show no no regard for civilian losses, unfortunately. And I understand, you know, they're they're angry, they're emotional because they they lost uh, you know several hundred uh, civilians. In the Hamas attack, uh, the pre uh, two two Saturdays ago, their military, their intelligence is much more sophisticated than that of Hamas. I don't know if Hamas does have any intelligence. It's oh, it's I'm them. yeah, the, no, the, they do, but it's not that sophisticated. It's not that equipped. But well, maybe... they don't have they, Yeah, they don't have satellite. They don't have ISR per se. They may you know they may be, um, uh, you know there may be some I guess. Um, drone footage that they can uh, call upon. But you're right, Israel has a more sophisticated, more a larger bu bureaucratic network anyway. And what's interesting is that that so-called robust, excellent intelligence capability completely failed to detect anything that Hamas was doing prior to the attack. And then after this hospital incident, they come up with a claim, oh yeah, we, we intercepted the conversation of two of these guys talking. Well, where were the interceptions previously? And in any, any event, uh, language authorities are just discounting those tapes as fabrications. Well, they, I mean, the, some in the Netanyahu government, these ultra right wingers have made it very clear that they basically want to exterminate all Palestinians. They want to get rid of them, kill them all. Uh, I know there are other Israelis that want to simply punish those who carried out the attack. But... Uh, again, I find uh, I, I don't think it's, a, you know, it's the old uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt allowed the Japanese to attack Pearl Harbor to get us into World War II meme uh, that this, it, this this is a very um, I, I just don't find it credible because the, Israel is not a monolith. There are people in Mossad. There are people in Shin Bet. The two intelligence services. There are people in Unit 8200, Israel's version of the National Security Agency. There are people in the Defense Ministry who don't like Bibi Netanyahu. And if if they had knowledge that he deliberately allowed Hamas to attack and kill some of El some of Israel's most elite soldiers, that you know he he wouldn't last a day. There'd be such outrage and blowback. So, you know, I dis I discount that. Uh, Israel, uh, anybody that's dealt with some of the Israeli military and intelligence officials would tell you that 
uh, if you're going to come up with a rank of the list of countries in the world with the most arrogant people who just think that they know everything, that their attitude is you can't teach me nothing. Uh, we are all knowing, all seeing. It's it's Israel. Um, it's not to say that that applies to all Israelis, but just uh, there's a it's, it's a significant cultural phenomena, uh, particularly among some of the Israeli men. And the Arab world is changing right now. We see they're unanimously condemning Israel. We haven't seen this before. It's changing. No, the no. Arab world is changing, and we have Turkey. We have Iran. These are not Arab countries. These are Turks and Persians. The problem is ignorance in the United States. You know, they do, there's I said like one raghead looks like the next. You know, they don't draw a distinction between Sunni Shia. Certainly don't draw a distinction between Arab Persian. Certainly don't just uh, recognize the Turks as some completely different ethnic group. They assume Palestinians are like, you know, Arabs, which they're not. Um, and yet within this, they don't. They also fail to understand that prior to this attack, Hamas was still a bit of a pariah, especially in Egypt, because the the predecessors, the, let's call them the ancestors of Hamas within the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, were the ones who assassinated Anwar Sadat back in, I believe it was 1981, 82. And, uh, you know, that was carried out by these radical Islamists. And so Hamas was not seen as somebody that was well embraced by either the Saudis or Egyptians. And I think Hamas, in this initial attack on Israel, really made a tactical mistake by killing as many civilians as they did. Now, there's some, there have been some Israelis come out and claim that uh, several of the civilian casualties were caused by friendly fire from Israeli uh, security forces, and, and that's always a possibility. But uh, what has then happened in the, is uh, because of Israel's overreaction, disproportionate reaction, or uh, unfocused reaction, because instead of punishing, as you talked about earlier, those who carried out the attacks, those who planned the attacks, those who funded the attacks, they're attacking all of, all of the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. And that has united the Muslim and Arab world, which are two different things. So the fact now that you've got Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, Yemen, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, go just go around the region. They are uniting now against Israel in a way we've never seen. And they're uniting at a time when the United States influence over those countries is the weakest it's ever been since the end of World War II. So I think I think what we're really seeing is the the definite possibility of Israel being compelled, coerced, or forced to accept a two-state solution. By dragging Israel to the conflict in Ukraine, it was totally the U.S. foreign policy that was pushing, that was forcing Israel to continue supporting right. Ukrainians. Well, yeah, Israel's done it to itself. Uh, seen as siding with Ukraine, and, and again, and it... It exposes the hypocrisy of Israel, but they, you know they've engaged with this kind of hypocritical, hypocritical behavior over the years. And the hypocrisy right now is they're embracing a Ukrainian government that has a solid core of Nazis uh, whose fathers, grandfathers were involved with rounding up and executing Jews. And, and, they, and they view Jews as a untermatch, some human. And, but that, that's who Israel sort of sides with because that's what the United States wanted and they want to stay on good terms with the United States to get the money and assistance from Washington. But, uh, you know, Russia has been largely consistent throughout. Uh, it fought, you know, about a 10, 12 year war against Islamic extremists in Russia, in Chechnya, and lost, you know, thousands of Russians died, uh, as well as thousands of terrorists. But Russia persevered, conquered, defeated, actually defeated those the terrorist elements, 
And now the Chechens are one of the most uh, feared and respected military units within the Russian army and uh, is a powerful force. And they're they're really chafing at what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. It's not sitting well with them. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, Russia intervened in Syria, I think starting roughly 2014, 2013, to help them defeat U.S.-backed Islamic insurgents. So Russia has always been pretty consistent about trying to stop Islamic extremism. And it's not come out and, you know, boldly endorsed Hamas. It's made the point that both sides need to stop killing civilians. But uh, in, the, in the course of this, Israel seems to be doing a lot of PR damage to itself. Uh, it's overreacted and it succeeded in uniting the Muslim and Arab world against it in a way that, uh, you know, we've, we've not seen since the creation of Israel. What was the reason for this visit of Biden to Israel? Why he did that, in your opinion? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if he went to give him the green light uh, to go into Gaza or to warn him not to go into Gaza. Uh, I think originally, <coughs> excuse me, the plan probably was that he was going to go to you know see what sort of what Bibi Netanyahu's uh, bottom line uh, stances were on certain issues, such as providing humanitarian aid to uh, the Gazan, uh, the, rough, the inhabitants of Gaza. And then he was going to go talk to uh, King of Jordan and President uh, al-Sisi of Egypt and uh, Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority and try to work out a deal. I, I think that was the original intent. But it, but that got completely blown up. So he was he was left having to go out and show, you know shill for Israel. Do you see any long term solution for what's going on in that region on the part of Israelis? Because they have to live together with these Arabs, with all these nations that's surrounding Israel. Sadly, no. I mean that's why I think it's so frightening and so dangerous. Um, because the Israelis, particularly the ultra right wing in Israel are intransigent. They they do not, and this is the irony, they do not view the Palestinians as human beings. They view them as animals, as subhumans. So here is Israel, whose foundation was predicated on the Holocaust, where Jews were treated as subhumans by the Nazis. And now, instead of acting with mercy, with some charity, with some generosity of spirit, Israel's behaving and talking in the same way that the Nazis talked in terms of how they treat the Palestinians. Now, I'm not saying all Israelis, but there's a significant minority, and some of them are holding political power, that they have no regard whatsoever for the Palestinians as human beings. They treat them as a lump, um, like a lump of dough, without recognizing that there are Christians and Muslims interspersed, and not all the Muslims are adherents of Hamas, but as they suffer loss from Israeli bombing, the support for Hamas among even Christians is going to go up, not down. And uh, Israel does not have the manpower to sustain a long protracted guerrilla war. Uh, and that's, you know, if they go into Gaza, they, I, I fear they're going to get bogged down. Uh, they created all this rubble in the streets. Uh, the tanks will not be able to maneuver. They've created all that rubble creates firing positions that Hamas can use where they have cover, concealment, and they can then attack with these anti-tank guided missiles, probably many that they got out of Ukraine. And uh, Israel will face another defeat. Uh, similar to what happened, actually worse than what happened in 2006. How do you see the future of Netanyahu in Israel? Is he going to continue as prime minister of Israel or is going to be dismissed after this incident? We have some sort of unity in Israel right now. The condition, the situation right now created this unity. As time goes by, what's going to happen in Israel? Well, the unity that exists right now is the unity against Hamas. 
but that does not necessarily mean that there's unity of support for Bibi Netanyahu. Uh, in fact, I suspect that, you know, if uh, unless Israel pulls off some miraculous military uh, act and completely crushes Hamas and the Palestinians surrender in the next two weeks, uh, I think Bibi Netanyahu will be lucky to make it through the end of November still as prime minister of Israel. And he's facing a possible jail term for uh, allegations of bribery. To defeat Hamas, how are they going to do that? Are they going to bomb him? Hmm. Are they going to go into Gaza? These large military equipments, big military equipments, are not capable to pass through the right. these narrow streets. Well, it's not, it's not just that. It's also that if, if Hezbollah decides to come in from the north, Israel has does not have the manpower and resources to fight a two-front war. And yes, they will have to go in on the ground. They can't bomb. They can't bomb their way out of this. Uh, bombing civilians on the grounds never worked uh, as a strategy to end a war, with the exception of a, using a nuclear device uh, it, twice in, in uh, Japan at the end of World War II. All the other bombing campaigns, whether we're talking the Eighth Air Force during World War II, uh, the U.S. bombing. Uh, Hanoi and Haiphong harbors in Vietnam, uh, the the first and second Gulf War, the first Gulf War, and then the war in Iraq, and the war in Afghanistan. It, it, you know, yeah, you blow up things, you kill people, you you know, create some rubble and wreckage, but it does not actually root out the people that you're trying to destroy, and force them into a surrender. You got to have troops on the ground, and when they put troops on the ground, they're going to be very susceptible to ambush. In terms of manpower, are they capable to do that? No, no. I mean, they're they're a largely a reserve army force, which means they, they don't have extensive training or experience of doing this. They will acquire the experience in the course of the operation, but they will also be taking significant casualties, I believe, both killed and wounded. This is a potential situation for Armageddon. Hezbollah, we have Syria, then we have Turks. They're so angry with the situation. And Pakistan said that if Israel attacked Turkey, they're going to bomb Israel. It's getting totally out of hand. Well, remember, even Pakistan offered Turkey to provide it with some nuclear weapons uh, in the event of uh, having to face off with Israel. So, I mean, that's what's really concerning that, again, you've got, it'd be one thing if it's just Iran talking trash, but it's not just Iran. <clears throat> you've got Syria, Turkey, and, just, and Syria and Turkey are at odds with each other. So the fact that they found something that they can agree on is, a, you know, should be just, you know, scaring uh, Western political leaders uh, to death because uh, it means it's uh, the, this Arab Muslim world, and we can't keep emphasizing that enough, is not just a Muslim world, it's an Arab world and other you know, those two come together to support the Palestinians. And then there are other people who are neither Arab nor Muslim. Like, say, in South Africa, they also support the Palestinians. Uh, and then, you know, Brazil. I, there's, you know, you know as well as I that there is a significant uh, Muslim population down around Fosto Iguazu uh, in that part, in, uh, that part of the country. So, you know, the, the the political winds are shifting against Israel. I, I uh, Candidly, I wonder how long Israel can continue to survive and thrive as a state with this level of animus and opposition against it. I don't know if Biden is in charge of this foreign policy. No, no, he's not. Then who's running the show? Some speculate Barack Obama. Uh, I I really don't have any good insight into that. Uh, but, uh, you know, Biden is, is not the chess master here at all. You know, he he's like if he knows where he is or remembers to, you know, change his adult depends diaper. So it's just, it really is, it's a, it's a travesty. And people around the world see this. I You know, they, they're not fools. And, and it, it, it's, you know, they can't imagine or understand 
why would the United States allow a man this inept, this incompetent, this unfit to continue to be in charge? And I know the, the, the foreign mind in this is they always assume that the U.S. has a secret plan they're not telling them about, that, that we've got this all worked out. We're just not revealing it to the rest of the world. And I, I would say, no, no, we don't. Not at all. If Israel goes into Gaza, you know, they're massing tanks right now. Uh, I think, frankly, the uh, Hamas wants them to come in, lure them in, and then once they're in and they're sort of boxed in, then they can start destroying them. Um, this, uh, I, I think this is potentially be very, very devastating for Israel. And will, uh, if, if they do suffer significant losses, will accelerate demands for Bibi Netanyahu to be removed, along with these ultra-right members of his uh, government. And uh, you'll see, uh, you know, sort of a more moderate wing of, Is uh, of, of Israelis come, come to power. And then they might be in a position to negotiate with Hamas. Uh, if whenever Israel is coming from a standpoint of appearing reasonable, it, it does, it cuts into Hamas's ability to win support from other countries. Because they don't, they're not predisposed to like Hamas at all. Jake Sullivan said that Al Qaeda is on our side in Syria. You know, they're mm -hmm. they're weaponizing these groups. They're yeah, they're turning yeah. against them. Well, it, it's not new. Remember, back in 1979 and going into 1981, when Ronald Reagan took over from Jimmy Carter. Back then, you had Israel selling weapons to Iran with the blessing of the United States. And at the same time, you had the United States supplying weapons to Iraq because Iran and Iraq were at war, and we were backing Iraq over Iran, even though we were still supplying weapons to Iran. It was like our policy was we want to encourage them to kill each other, which they did, and then millions died. Uh, at least I think over a million died from on the Iranian side. And, you know, it just, it just shows the immorality of U.S. policy in the past. Uh, it was not given by some, driven by some desire to uphold human rights values and freedom and democracy, just the opposite. It was, it was a, you know, cruel ploy to try to uh, weaken both states and thereby weaken Russia's influence or the Soviet Union's influence in the region at that time. How do you see the support of Biden from the Israeli lobby in the U.S.? Are they behind Biden or are they looking for another option, a Republican that may put an end to the Ukraine war? Well, right now, no. Right now, they're going to, uh, they'll be backing Biden the best they can, but they'll be working with individual members of Congress to make sure that they get 60% of the money, not 14% of the money that Biden's proposed. Mm -hmm.